All right, hello everybody. This is Derek Demeter with the Emil Bueller Planetarium coming at you again for another exciting virtual public show. Tonight we have two special guests joining us. Um, we have uh, Shannon Schmoll from the Abrams Planetarium and we have uh, Tiffany Stone Woolbrook from the Ward Beecher Planetarium at Youngstown University in Ohio. And of course, you know our amazing communications officer, Justin Cirillo. Justin, you have a really cool uh, new upgrade with you. It's like you're, you are literally now the communications officer or you might be a sports anchor or, or both. I mean, yeah, I kind of, I kind of feel like data and then maybe next week I'll get some glasses and I'll be kind of Jordy data, you know, hybrid and I'll just keep know, going. I, I don't, I don't think that's such a bad idea after all, right. but, uh, anyway, so we have a very exciting program tonight. So all three of us, uh, Shannon, myself and Tiffany, uh, we were part of a program called Astronomy in Chile Educators Ambassador Program, or ASIP uh, for short. And uh, what we wanted to do is we want to talk about some exciting things going on in Chile. And uh, there's this kind of nickname for Chile. It's the astronomy capital of the world. And, uh, and there's a reason for that. It's dark. Would you all agree with that? It's pretty dark and pretty beautiful, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely uh, an amazing place uh, to go. And so what we're going to do real quick is we're um, going to take a little bit of an, a, a trip down to Chile, and we're going to talk about some of the astronomy, uh, and then our, um, other, uh, our other guests are going to be talking about some of the amazing scientific research facilities there, as well as some of the amazing science that's coming out of these uh, observatories. And of course, uh, Justin is on call. If you have any questions or anything you would like to present to any of us tonight, be sure to uh, leave a comment in the Facebook Live chat. Now, of course, if you're on YouTube uh, and you're watching us at a later date, uh, you know, be sure to leave a comment and uh, any of us could reply to that comment and we'd love to answer your questions. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and jump in first. Uh, we're gonna kind of break this up into three parts. Uh, so I'll be jumping in real briefly for the first half and I'll let uh, Shannon and Tiffany kind of take the main stage because they have some really cool scientific stuff to show with you here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to go ahead and visit, uh, uh, basically we're going to look at Chile. Uh, now, of course, here we are. Now we're in central Florida here and, and our, our guests are over here in the uh, kind of Midwest area, but we're going to go ahead down in south of the equator and we are gonna make our way down to the country of Chile. Now, uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna turn on the borders just to give you an idea of kind of where everything. So Chile is this very long country on the western side of South America. It's not very wide, but it's very long. And just to give you an idea, you could fit pretty much the United States uh, in width uh, from the top to the bottom. So even though it's a very narrow country, uh, east to west, it's very long from north to south. And the area that we're gonna primarily explore is this region right here in Chile. So Chile um, is, is basically surrounded by very extremely tall mountains here to the east. We call these the Andes. And what's happening is, is that uh, the Pacific plate is basically pushing down or going down underneath the, uh, the South American plate. And what's happening is it's lifting up uh, this part of the uh, the world and essentially you're getting these really extremely tall mountains over here in the Andes So these are some extremely tall places and and uh, you'll see later on when we visit some of the observatories in this area You will see that these observatories are in very high altitudes extremely high altitudes with some of them uh, and uh, There's a reason for that Well, let me talk a little briefly about some of the uh, the meteorology going on with uh, with this area here too. So you have these really tall mountains, the Andes along the eastern side of Chile. You also have a, uh, you also have, uh, you have the winds blowing from the Pacific. And what happens is, is that you have the updraft of the mountains and the winds of the Pacific. And what happens is, is this creates kind of essentially a, a very dry air in this area. Very, very dry air. Um, and what happens is, is that it not only dries the air out to the point where there's almost very little water vapor in the air. Actually, the Atacama, which is right here, this is the area we're gonna look at, the Atacama Desert, and this is part of the Altiplano, which is actually a highlands area of, of South America. Um, it has very stable air because of the fact that you have a very nice 
high pressure, generally very nice steady um, air. And this creates very good seeing conditions. Now, if you watched our virtual star party a few weeks ago, where we talked about weather, and if you haven't, seeing is very important for astronomy. It shows you how, how clear the sky really is. So you don't have a lot of turbulence in the air. Your stars are nice and crisp. And this gives us the ability to observe things in great detail than what we would see, obviously, uh, if we had bad seeing. But the other thing we have, too, is not only do we have good seeing in this area of the world, but we also have extremely good transparency because we, A, are in a very high altitude. Most of the observatories in the Andes are, are, are over 9,000 feet in elevation, and some of them are even higher than that, like the Alma Observatory, which is almost 16,500 feet above sea level. And being such high altitude, you're above most of the atmosphere. And if you eliminate water vapor, you eliminate all these things, you, you increase the transparency of good seeing, these are all the right conditions necessary for astronomy. So this is why, uh, and, and the many reasons why Chile is considered to be the astronomy capital of the world. There are lots of observatories here, it is nice and dark. But the other thing that makes Chile special, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, to another software is the fact that we are south of the equator. This is important because of several reasons. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of my time here. Now what's really cool is you might have been able to join us in some of our night sky programs um, over the last couple of weeks and we've been exploring the night skies here in central Florida. But we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the skies down in the Southern Hemisphere. And one of the things that's also extremely important about being here in, in Chile in the Southern Hemisphere is the galactic plane, basically our Milky Way that we see here, this beautiful uh, band of light that contains billions of stars, that's our Milky Way, is very high up in the sky, almost near zenith in this location. And you get a very nice view of the sky, both south, and north of the galactic plane. So you get a very good view of the universe from this location. And some of the things that you can see um, that are pretty interesting that you can't really see very well uh, over here in, uh, in, in this part of our latitude and up, uh, one of the things that's very famous in the southern hemisphere are these four stars right here. This is called, uh, this right here is called Crux, the cross right here. So we have stars like Ocrux, Gocrux, Mimosa, and we have Baycrux. These are the three, or excuse me, the four stars in the Southern Cross. And what's interesting about the Southern Hemisphere is that there is no uh, visible Southern star. Of course, we have Polaris here in the Northern Hemisphere. If you look towards the Big Dipper and it points down to Polaris, you don't have that in the Southern Hemisphere. There is a star near the South Pole, which is called Sigma Octanus but you can't see it with the naked eye. But what is interesting is that if we move time around, the Southern Cross, and I can do that real quickly here, we can see if we were to move time around, um, you can see how the Southern Cross acts almost like an arrow marker to the area where we would find, which is located kind of over here in this area, part of Octants, which is called the Octant. Um, this is where we find the Southern Star, uh, sigma Octonus. So the Southern Cross is a marker, let me go ahead and get rid of this here, is a marker for locating things in the sky, uh, or the, excuse me, locating the Southern Star, uh, Sigma Octonus. We also have some really cool, interesting, fun constellations in the Southern Hemisphere. Just below our, our Southern Cross here, kind of pointing down to it, is Musca, the fly. So uh, we can actually put up the artwork here. So we got an actual fly in the sky just below the Southern Cross. And uh, that was a real treat to see some of these constellations that I normally uh, couldn't see from here. We have just below that, just below Musca, we have chameleons, the chameleon, um, which is really, really cool. We have Opus, the bird of paradise, right over here. We even have a peacock, Pavo the peacock, right over here. Um, so you can see that a lot of different, there's also all these different constellations, Volans, the flying fish, and um, these are all constellations that we also, that we see primarily in the Southern Hemisphere. But the other interesting thing about the Southern Hemisphere as well, is that the indigenous people of Chile and other parts of, of, of South America, 
not only saw, um, excuse me, not only saw uh, the stars, but they actually, because the Milky Way is so bright in these areas, they actually could see um, what we call dark constellations. These, these, dust, these dust areas of our Milky Way that basically block the light of stars behind it, they actually saw this as, as, as animals, as people, as beings. For example, right here, this is called the llama. You can actually kind of see there's his feet here. All right, there's his feet here. You got his, his, his body, his head right here. Uh, there's also a baby llama down here. There's the baby llama's head. There's the body right there. Um, if we come over here towards the Southern Cross, we can see just below there, there's actually a, a dark nebula right here that makes up a toad, a, fr a toad in the sky. Um, and we also have a, a partridge right here. Uh, so you can see that there's different, uh, they not only saw um, the stars that we would see, but they also were able to identify these unique dark constellations in the sky and that they had legends about them as well. And uh, there was, um, you know, all kinds of, of, of t stories, not only told of the stars, but of the, the Milky Way itself. So the Milky Way is, is really the, the star of the southern sky. And I wanted to show you some of my cool photos. I had a chance, uh, when we went to Chile, uh, a friend of mine that was part of the team as well got a chance to go and photograph the Milky Way there. And a lot of people pilgrimage to the uh, southern hemisphere in Chile to see just how vibrant the Milky Way is. It is absolutely stunning. If you get a chance to go out to Chile, I highly recommend it. The skies are super, super clear. And this right here, you see here, this is, these are not clouds. This is actually air glow. This is uh, high in, up in our upper atmosphere. It's being uh, our oxygen and other uh, elements are being ionized by the solar radiation, just like we would see with the aurora. And that's creating air glow. And normally air glow is not visible because of the fact that our atmosphere obscures it. But being that you're above most of the atmosphere here, you actually get to see that air glow, which is absolutely amazing. So um, again, a real treat to be able to go here. And so uh, that's a little bit about kind of uh, the astronomy, uh, the, the, what makes astronomy in Chile so valuable, so important. Um, and uh, again, you know, some of the dark skies you see there and some of the constellations. So if you go to Chile yourself, you can see a whole new sky. And for those that live in Chile, well, you can come up here and see a whole new sky. I have friends of mine down in the Southern Hemisphere that are just excited to see the Ursa Major or the Big Dipper or even the Little Dipper because they just, you know, they don't get to see that. So Chile is this very special place for astronomy and there are a lot of observatories and a lot of facilities that are being built. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and turn it over uh, to Shannon and she's going to tell you all about some of these really cool facilities that we got to visit, but also some of the, where they're located and some of the instruments that are found there. So Shannon, take it away. Oh, Shannon, you're muted still. Darn mute button. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Dr. Shannon Schmoll from the Abrams Planetarium, and I'm going to take you down to the, uh, down to Chile. We're going to go see some of these uh, facilities that are down there. Uh, there are about a dozen or so facilities with more um, being built or planned down in Chile. So it really is uh, the astronomy uh, capital of the world. Uh, we're going to focus on just a few of them, the ones that are funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, so I'm going to use a software called Worldwide Telescope. Um, and I'm going to actually run it from here. So we are up in Lansing, Michigan, which is right around here, uh, and that's where we're located. So we're going to fly from Michigan down to Chile. Uh, this is actually a touchscreen so, um, thing that we set up within Worldwide Telescope that I am just sort of using for today. Uh, but we're going to head down to Chile. So it's goodbye, United States. 
fly down to Chile. I know it's going to be a little bit jumpy for you, um, but here we are. So we've got Chile here on this western coast of South America. Again, very long and skinny country right here. Um, and in the northern half of the country where it, there is desert, where it is very dry, is where we find these telescopes. So we're going to just head over to the section on telescopes. And again, we're going to be focusing on um, uh, actually five. We're going to focus on these three first. I'm going to briefly mention and talk about SOAR. Um, SOAR is partially owned by Michigan State University where I am, uh, so I feel like I would be remiss to not mention that. And then we're going to briefly, my, uh, something's moving, that's funny. Um, that was unexpected. Uh, and then we're also going to briefly talk about uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, which was formerly known as LSST or the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is a brand new, um, a brand new telescope that is currently being built. But we're going to go ahead and start here with the Sarah Tololo Inter-American Observatory, or CTIO. And we're going to see where that is located. It's located in the mountains, so we're going to zoom in right onto the peak where the Sarah Tololo Inter-American Observatory is. This is one of the first major observatories built in Chile. This big, bright, shiny dome is the Victor M. Blanco telescope that we'll look at in a little bit more, uh, in a little while. It is near La Serena, Chile, which is the nearest large city. It's not the nearest city, but the nearest large city to it. Uh, and it's at an elevation of about 7,241 feet. Um, and so when you're up there, so we've all been up there, and when you're up there, it's um, very dusty since it is very dry. You can almost you taste the dust. That's what I remember about being up there is just tasting the dust as we were driving up. And uh, at that altitude, you you can tell that there's something a little bit different, but it doesn't really hit you that hard. You, you start walking around and you notice you get out of breath maybe a little bit uh, faster than you normally would. Um, and the other two observatories we're going to visit shortly, Soar and Gemini, are on a nearby peak. Um, and this is just a really cute fox that I took a picture of back when I was there. He, the foxes like to come up to the dormitories and they get scraps from the chefs who work up there. So um, he was pretty cute. I liked him. I think it's a him. I don't really know. Uh, and then this is just a sort of view of, of the peak and the terrain around here so you can see um, what it's like and how high up we are. And just to give you a sense, um, if we zoom out just a little bit, you can see there's this road here, and this road will connect back over to the other telescopes that are nearby. Um, so let's look at CTIO just a little bit more. A little bit closer. So like I said, um, it was uh, started doing science in 1964. The Victor M. Blanco um, came online in the 1970s. It is partially funded by the National Science Foundation and it is run by the um, Association for, of University, Universities for Research in Astronomy or Aura for short. Um, they have like their own, they have a little dormitory there and they gave us their own little shampoo bottles uh, with the Aura logo on it like it was a hotel and I still have that bottle somewhere because I thought that was so adorable. Um, uh, but it's also operated under the auspices of National Optical Astronomy Observatory. So the observatory runs it, but Aura is sort of the administrative unit that um, runs it as well. So it's sort of this two-tiered thing going on there. All right, uh, so if we move on, uh, we can see that this is the general layout of CTIO. So the telescopes are up here on the very top of the peak. Um, we've got telescopes throughout. There's um, down here the main dormitory facility, includes a cafeteria, so all visiting scientists um, and staff who work up here would come up here and eat. So there's a kitchen and there's um, chefs that make very delicious food all the time. Um, and then there's, you can come down a little bit more, there's a few more facilities including some more dormitories down here. Um, also a, a bit of medical equipment. Um, and if we look at this um, a little bit more, uh, since most people are staying awake during the day, these dorms that are over here, again, this was built in the 60s. Most of the furniture is original to the 60s. So we went, when we stayed there, it was like walking into the set of Mad Men. Um, because all the, the furniture was definitely still from the 60s. Everything's covered in blackout curtains uh, so that people can sleep during the day and stay up at night for their observing. So you'll see signs everywhere about staying silent and not um, disturbing people. 
And this is a control room um, for the Victor M. Blanco telescope, which is the largest telescope on CTIO. Um, so he is the former director of Aura. He now works for the NSF. Um, and but he was telling us about um, in this picture about his time um, working on the Blanco in the 90s, uh, looking at supernova that ultimately led to the discovery that the university was accelerating in its expansion. And that work uh, won a Nobel Prize. Um, so he did not personally win the Nobel Prize, but he wasn't one of the team members who won um, that was on that project. All right. And let's take a closer look just to show you all the different telescopes. So when we say there's about a dozen facilities in Chile with telescopes, uh, a lot of those facilities have multiple telescopes and multiple um, um, instruments on them. So the Blanco is the largest in the first um, right there. It's this nice big one. It's a 4.1 meter telescope. It's been going on and since the 70s. Um, and then there's a bunch of smaller telescopes you can see here. A lot of these are run by different universities um, that are basically leasing out land. There's some that are run by Google, I believe. There's these, gam these, these small gamma ray monitoring ones. Um, this is called the mushroom farm. Uh, and I, um, over this way, you can see where the dorms are, um, where everyone hangs out when they are getting their meal and so on. So that is CTIO. Uh, I'm going to show you some more pictures of the Blanco. Um, the main instrument on the Blanco telescope, so this is really the main um, big telescope there, is called the DEC cam or the dark energy camera. But Tiffany, I think, is going to be talking a lot more about the work that that one does. So I will leave that for her. All right, so next up, we're going to head over to that other peak and take a look at Gemini South. So and we'll get to why it's called Gemini South in a minute. But this is the Gemini Observatory. This is a slightly higher peak at about 80, a little over 8,900 feet above sea level, also near La Serena. It's on a peak called Serra Pachon. And if you drive down the road just a little bit, we will find SOAR, and we'll look at that one next. And so we'll take a look at the area here. You can really see that this is quite a steep cliff down this way. Um, it's very, very, very windy up here. Um, and right over here, you can see the SOAR telescope right on the edge of that hill. Um, it's almost, uh, I remember people were trying to take videos of themselves talking when we were up there, and it was almost impossible to understand because of the wind, because you are so high up. So Gemini, um, if you remember the constellation Gemini, it is the, the twins, uh, Castor and Pollux. And so the name Gemini for this telescope is no accident because there are two telescopes that are identical, each 8.1 meters in size for their primary mirror. Um, so with telescopes, the bigger the mirror, the better, because that means you can gather more light. And the more light you gather, the fainter objects you can see. And so Gemini, um, has these two identical telescopes. One is Gemini North uh, on the peak of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and then there's Gemini South on Sarah Pichon in Chile. And the advantage of having these two identical telescopes is that allows us to cover basically the entire sky. So if you, uh, we, we heard from Derek earlier, we were looking at constellations and part of the sky that we cannot see in the Northern Hemisphere. And similarly, there's constellations in the Northern Hemisphere that you'll never be able to see in Chile or anywhere else in the Southern Hemisphere. So by having both of these telescopes, we get full coverage of the sky with these amazing pieces of technology. Uh, and so they work together in order to do that, um, though they do have each their own unique pieces of technology as well. Um, moving on. Zooming in, whee, okay, there we go. I don't know why it does that. So again, like I said, this is about an eight, this is an 8.1 meter telescope. So this is twice as large as the telescope in, um, in the Blanco. Um, and this observes in both the visible and infrared, infrared wavelengths. So this, oh, what our eyes can see and also um, a little bit longer wavelengths, lower energy. This is a partnership. Most telescopes, especially facilities as large, are partnerships between multiple countries and facilities. Um, there's no way an individual place would be able to fund uh, the facilities um, individually. So the United States, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile have all helped fund this particular telescope. 
and um, what's really fantastic about uh, Gemini is that it's equipped with this system um, called adaptive optics. And so um, adaptive optics is, a, when we think about telescopes, the biggest thing that's in our way is the atmosphere, essentially. Um, and so being high on peaks helps us get above some of our atmosphere, but we still have to look through some of that air. And the biggest problem with that is going to be the twinkling that, that it causes. And so that's why we put telescopes out in space, like the Hubble Space Telescope. We get away from the atmosphere, we get away from that twinkling and all of the blurriness that that might cause. And uh, the problem with space telescopes, though, is when they break, it's really expensive to send spacecraft up to go and fix them or we just kind of let them die and then we go put up a new one later on. So having telescopes on the ground means that we can keep, um, we can very easily go up a mountain and fix it. And so adaptive optics allows us to get the same resolution essentially as a space telescope, but on Earth. Um, and so what it does is it uses a laser guide star. So this is the Keck Observatory, so, um, which is using a similar system, where it shines this big laser up into the sky. And then it, it observes this laser for the twinkling that's happening. And then it has these actuators on one of the mirrors, not the primary mirror, but another mirror down the optic system that it can um, adjust just right, very, very tiny adjustments, smaller than the, the width of our hair, in order to cancel out the effects of twinkling. And this gives us the resolution that's um, as good as Hubble. And I think we're getting even better than Hubble right now. And so um, Gemini is equipped with one of these adaptive optic systems and it's one of the best in the world. Uh, so that's one of the really nice things of the, about this telescope, not only its size at 8.1 meters, but also this adaptive optic system. All right. And we did that. All right, so that's Gemini. And let's head down to SOAR. So like we saw, SOAR is just down the road. So let's zoom in a little bit more. Uh, so I just want to bring up SOAR. SOAR is very special to us at Michigan State University. This again is a partnership between the government of Chile, Brazil, CTIO, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and MSU. Um, it's a four meter telescope, so about, about the same size as the Blanco telescope. Um, and what's really valuable for a you know, university to go in onto a telescope like this is that MSU gets um, guaranteed time on this telescope. So the way that the telescopes generally work is that in order for an astronomer to have time on the telescope, they submit a proposal. Other uh, a team of astronomers or a committee member will decide the merit of that particular proposal and grant the time or not. And then you get put into the schedule for when the conditions are right, they'll observe for you and send you the data if your proposal is chosen. And that's true for SOAR as well, except that all of the partners on here get guaranteed time every single month. And so that allows at MSU as well as our other facilities opportunities to do science that might seem a little riskier that a proposal system might reject because there, there's less likely to be interesting results from it. Um, or uh, for longer term observing that requires a lot of observations that you wouldn't be able to get on another telescope. Um, and there's also several instruments on SOAR, um, one of which is the Spartan infrared camera. Um, and I really like this story because it was actually completely made at in Michigan in the East Lansing, Greater Lansing area, to the, down to the point where the crate that it lives in, the box it lives in, was painted Chevy white by a car detailer just down the road from MSU. Um, so it's a, uh, but this is a really cool spectrograph. So it takes the light and infrared and splits it up into its component parts so we can understand what's going on. Um, and this is used quite a bit. This was designed by students along with uh, Professor Ed Lowe at MSU. Uh, and he used this uh, instrument quite a bit to study supernovae uh, and the molecular structure within supernovae. Um, Ed Lowe, unfortunately, he passed away about a year ago and we miss him a whole lot. He was a very wonderful man and his legacy will live on here in SOAR um, with this wonderful instrument. All right. All right. And let's go back. We're going to go farther north now from near La Serena. 
up to the Atacama Desert where the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array is or ALMA. All right, so we're in the desert. So this is one of the driest places in the world. And ALMA is split into two separate locations. There's the Operation Support Facility. Uh, this is an older picture. It's um, built up quite a bit more. They have very nice uh, dormitory facilities and dining facilities now. This is located near San Pedro de Atacama in Chile at about 10,000 feet. Um, and so this is where a lot of the work gets done. So this is about the limit of where your, your body can handle um, in terms of altitude without needing to to really um, get checked out. There is a medical facility here. Um, so if you go any higher than this, you need to be checked out um, by the medical staff in order to make sure um, that you are healthy enough to go any higher than 10,000 feet. Um, up here, you have to drive uh, very slowly um, up to 16,597 feet, so almost 16,600 feet above sea level. Um, so this is the array operation site. So this is where Alma actually sits. Uh, and so it's so, the atmosphere is so thin up here that when people are generally only allowed to go up here for about two hours at a time. Um, only a few people are allowed longer. And uh, you, everyone is required to wear oxygen now, I think because of ASAP. <laughs> Um, we had so many people who had to wear oxygen that it is now required that everyone wears an oxygen tank. Uh, the year we went, only one person was wearing oxygen and everyone else had these canisters and we'd take like hits of oxygen and be like, oh, oxygen, how nice. Um, but it is really weird up there. Um, your brain does start to, to change. You are losing oxygen. Your blood oxygen levels uh, drop really fast. Uh, so... Like a lot of people, when they go up there, they have to take lists of what they're doing. And it's not just a to-do list, like go fix this on the telescope. It's go to this part of the telescope and turn the screw to the left five times. Take the screw off. It has to be very detailed because you might forget because uh, the oxygen is so weird. I know for me, um, I, had, I was learning just like a little bit of Spanish in order to like get around Chile when I was down there. And I uh, studied Russian a lot. I studied Russian in high school and college. And I was doing like really well with my Spanish. I was like speaking it a little bit more by the end of this trip. Uh, but when I got up there, like anytime I tried to like say anything in Spanish, it just came out in Russian. Like I, just, I could not say it in Spanish because my brain was just like, foreign language. We will go to the one you know best. And so it's, it's a really weird experience to not have control over your brain. Um, so let's go. Uh, so this is uh, the Chaknantor Plateau um, up here at the at this elevation. You can see there's, oh, we went over. <laughs> uh, there's even um, peaks that go even higher than this. And I think there are some facilities, some private facilities that are even higher at this point. All right, so let's take a closer look at Alma. So Alma is um, a collaboration between the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, the European Southern Observatory, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, and the Chilean government. So this is a US, Europe, Japanese, and Chilean effort in order to make this happen. And uh, each one, uh, um, Japan, Europe and the US each had to make their own um, set of telescopes. So just a quick overview of what we mean by this. This is a radio telescope. So this is observing in radio wavelengths. And it's an array. So it's actually a series of 66 separate radio antennas that join together as if they are one telescope. And so the way that the work got split up in order to build this facility uh, is a third of each of those uh, telescopes were built by each of the three main partners of Japan, Europe, and the US. They were given specific design specifications that they had to meet, but otherwise they could each make their own design. So you can see that uh, each um, telescope is slightly different depending on who built it. And then they each have their own facilities for where they like store and work on the telescopes, and they're also very different. One is a very large hangar, one is a small smaller indoor space and one is just completely out in the open. The US of course has the giant hangar because uh, we must have the really big ones. Um, but 
And then we have the dormitories for visitors. There is a clinic there for anyone who is having difficult with the, uh, the altitude and the main administrative offices here where people are working on scheduling and so on. Uh, so how does Alma work? So I said it's an array. So we're gonna go up to uh, this, um, up, back up to the high site, it's called. So the, what we want for a telescope, size is very important. So we established it before that size is really important. The bigger your telescope, the more light collecting area you have, the better. We also want a bigger telescope because it gives us better resolution. The longer your wavelength, the bigger your telescope has to be to have the same resolution. So for optical light, to get the same, um, Hubble has a really good resolution. We can look at very small um, details within our sky, but for radio light to get the same resolution as Hubble, we need something that's miles wide, um, about 20 miles wide or so in radio light. And that's impossible. We can't build a single telescope that is that big, but we can take several telescopes place them in um, different locations um, out to about 16 kilometers wide here at Alma in order to, and then connect them together in order to have them act as a single telescope with that same resolution. So Alma now has the same resolution more or less as Hubble. Um, and even though we're not collecting light in this entire area, um, we don't need to, we can get enough light from the, the individual antennas, but this gives us the resolution we need to actually see really fine detail, which Tiffany will show us, I'm sure, some really lovely pictures. Um, so this ring is sort of the effective size of the Alma telescope. Uh, and there's, again, 66 radio antennas. So this is what they all look like, all up on the uh, peak there. 54 of them are these 12 foot antennas that can go out to again 16 kilometers apart at their farthest point. But then there's also these 12 seven foot ones that stay pretty compact. So the really wide ones give us this really nice um, detailed view and a very narrow field of view, whereas a smaller array will give us a much wider field of view with less detail so we get the big picture of what's going on. Uh, and this array can move. So they can move these 12-foot uh, telescopes in smaller if they want a bigger picture with less detail, or they can move them out if they want um, more detail. And so they have special uh, movers, uh, special vehicles in order to move those. They also use those vehicles in order to move them up and down the mountain when they need to be fixed. If there's a, something that needs to be fixed that's going to take a lot longer than a few hours, they'll need to bring it down to fix at the operation support facility uh, because we, again, people can't stay up there for very long. All right. Um, so here's a picture. There's Otto and Lori are the names of the transporters. Um, so, uh, and they can again move out to these different spots all over out to about 16 um, kilometers wide. There's also up here a building right there which houses this entire room of just a bunch of computers, which I think is the equivalent of about 3 million laptops. I might be remembering that wrong. Uh, but basically a lot of laptops in order to correlate all the data between these telescopes. So you have to take all these signals from these different telescopes and you have to um, correlate them just right and precisely so that it comes together as if it was one. And so it requires this large um, correlator or a supercomputer that lives on the summit as well up here with it. This is considered the brain of the, of the telescope. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing this and go show you a few other pictures real quick, just to kind of give you a sense of scale. Um, here we go. So here's Blanco at CTIO. I think that's Tiffany right there. <laughs> um, she took this picture. She took a lot of really nice pictures, but here is the Blanco. Just to give you a sense of scale, that is inside is a four meter telescope. And we'll look around here. You can see what it's like. At this peak. See all the different scopes up here. Let's move over to Gemini. So again, we're just one peak over. 
Uh, if we look over this way, this really gives you a sense of just how tall. This is Kristen Dage. She's one of our graduate students at MSU. She uses SOAR for her work. She's about to graduate with her PhD. So congratulations, Kristen. Um, but just look over, this is the edge of the road right there. And you can just look over that peak. You can see why it's really windy up there. And if you're afraid of heights, be careful. And then here's Gemini. And then right over this hill and then down just a little ways, um, you would see the site for the um, Vera Rubin Observatory, um, formerly known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So this is a brand new survey telescope that is um, nearing completion and being built. Uh, when I was there in 2015, they had just blown away the rock and flattened it out in order to start construction. And um, I was there again about a year ago, and they had um, put the pier in for the scope. So it's coming along, and we're very excited. But let's go inside Gemini now, just to give you a sense of size. All right. This is an 8.1 meter telescope. We're going to zoom out. This was taken with a, a phone, so there's weird phantom legs, so I'm sorry for that. There's not ghosts, I promise. Okay, so here's uh, our lovely friend Vivian, um, who's on a project with us, who I haven't mentioned that yet. So one thing um, that Tiffany and I are working on is another project called Big Astronomy, and this is a planetarium show and um, related resources that is going to explore astronomy in Chile, but not only that the teams that make all of this happen. So I've shown you these amazing facilities. I've talked about the dormitories, the chefs who are up there, that we have to have medical facilities. There's engineers who have to keep everything working. Um, there's takes really big teams to make these observatories work in the first place. And uh, so we're exploring all the different careers that happen at these observatories um, through a planetarium show, online resources, social media events, and hands-on activity kits. So Vivian is another one of our team members right here. And here she is standing next to this 8.1 meter mirror right here. And this mirror has to be cleaned um, pretty regularly every few years. It actually goes through this, you see this square right here, this opens up and it goes into a polishing chamber. So you really don't want to break this mirror. That would be definitely more than seven years bad luck. So be careful. Um, but this mirror does have to stay highly reflective um, and protected from the elements. And just look at how big this thing is. It's huge. And this isn't even like the biggest telescope out there anymore. Um, also with these telescopes, the way that they work is they're housed inside these buildings. Uh, but you can see that there's all of these, um, these windows essentially around here. They're not really windows, but there's parts that open up so that you can make the inside of the observatory the same as the outside, the same temperature, so that you don't have any weird air flows happening that could possibly mess up your image as you're taking the, um, the images with your telescopes. Um, so there's a lot of engineering that goes into this. And then this is the slit that opens up so the telescope can actually look out of the dome, but otherwise the dome is protecting the telescope all around it. All right, let's go check out Alma. Here's those uh, smaller radio telescopes at Alma. There's some people for reference here. All the cars that you drive up there have to have roll bars on there because if you roll over when you're at high altitude, you gotta be very careful and safe. Here's one of the bigger scopes, one of the 12 foot ones, just for reference. And it really looks like Mars up there. There's a point when you're driving up, there's a lot of vegetation. There's really cute vicuña that live around there. Um, they're like these little llama-like animals. Um, they, there's this point though, when you're driving up, there's a certain elevation where just like all life stops. There's just nothing anymore. And it's really weird and eerie. All right, and then here's one of those movers, just to give you a sense of size. That's a seat for the human to drive it. There's only four people, I think, who are trusted to drive these things. Uh, one of them is featured in our show, Big Astronomy. So we'll just look at these tires. They're like the size of a person almost. And look how many there are. 
So these are what they use in order to move these telescopes. So these are some of the facilities down in Chile, but the science, um, we build these in order to do the science and learn about the universe and about ourselves. That's Tim, he's the person who leads the ASAP program. Um, smiling back at us. But I'm gonna turn it over to Tiffany now, who's gonna tell us about the wonderful science that these facilities do. Thank you, Shannon. That was great. It's sort of like a, a trip down memory lane. Uh, all right, let me share my screen. So Shannon has been really focusing on the, the telescopes and the observatories, uh, but I'm here to share with you about the science that are, that's coming out of the observatories. So let me share my photos here and we'll get started. Uh, I did want to mention that if there's anyone who has uh, questions or, or anything like that, please feel free to, to drop those in the comment section because I, I, I like interaction. I, I'm not so comfortable talking at a screen. So um, if you have questions, I would love to hear them and, and have some discussion. Um, you, you guys are seeing my screen okay, right? Um, the first picture I have here is of the inside of the Blanco telescope, this uh, at CTIO. Uh, Shannon showed us some wonderful pictures um, of the, the, the Blanco telescope, the, the huge uh, massive observatory. And this is, uh, I like this photo because it's sort of a cross-sectional cut where you can see what the inside, you can see where the telescope actually is and, and get a size comparison a bit. Um, so this uh, it, in this red circle here is the per is, are people compared to the telescope. Um, this is a, the, a four meter telescope, so you can measure four meters across the primary mirror. Um, and it, Shannon mentioned this briefly, but it won a Nobel Prize. We don't talk about observatories winning Nobel prizes because they don't um, they don't like get that official recognition. But uh, those discoveries would not happen without the observatories. So we like to say that uh, CTI won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of what we now call dark energy, but the discovery of the expansion of the universe. And uh, so that has spurred um, a, the dark energy survey, which just wrapped up last year. Uh, it was, it's has a, there's a dark energy camera, which is mounted in this um, by the secondary mirror at the top of the telescope here where this green circle is. Uh, this is an actual photograph um, that I took when I was there last year of the Blanco. Uh, so this is, this is the actual telescope, the primary mirror is down here. You can see the cabling for the deck cam up here and uh, there are people down here for scale. This thing is enormous and it's like Shannon mentioned, it's not like it was the biggest telescope in the southern hemisphere for decades and it like to uh, you know people who work there like to brag about that but it's not like at all anymore the Gemini South telescope is eight meters across so these telescopes are getting huge um, and, and so just experiencing them up close is quite an amazing experience it's not something you forget uh, so the dark energy survey was five years long it, uh, it ended last year in 2019, and the, the main purpose was to try to characterize what dark energy is and to study this new, um, this great new discovery in more detail. So it, has a, it had a huge field of view. Oftentimes telescopes want to look really deep into space so that we can get a lot of detail in a very small area, but this is uh, the, the Dark energy survey was looking at a two in two, a little more than two degree field of view, which would be like like two and a half full moons across the sky, roughly something like that. That's pretty wide for a telescope, um, and it was surveying a huge swath of the southern sky, uh, and it did that uh, ten times over five years, and it was looking for things like um, type one a supernova, which helps us. Um, determine distances and things like that, really to just try to understand um, the, the framework of our universe and the, this expansion and what, how it's changing and, uh, over time. So uh, 
this telescope has been around since 1970, I think it was 1973. It's been around for a long time. There's a lot, uh, and the people who work here and live here, as Shannon mentioned, are really, really proud of their observatory, and they should be. It's, it has decades of amazing science uh, under its belt, and it's continuing to be useful even today. Um, so I, and I, I did want to reiterate, as Shannon was saying, that these people who work on these observatories, there's many of them, so many people you wouldn't even think of. The astronomer is one of the last people that come in uh, during these discoveries. And uh, it, the telescope operators, the, the chefs, the cooks, all everyone um, works hard to make the observatory run and to make this science possible. Tiffany, real quick, um, Paige asked on. Oh, you're muted. Uh, Paige was asking, uh, did you say there was a dark energy camera? And if so, how does that work? Yeah, so it was attached to the telescope and it was imaging the nighttime sky. In fact, this image here shows what the deck cam is seeing, uh, how it sees the sky. And uh, so this would be like a, a still image that it would take at night. Um, and, it, and it just collected that data and observed what it observed just a huge area of the nighttime sky. Did that answer the question okay, I think? Great, great. So the, the, the deck cam is still there. I'm actually not uh, up to speed on what they're doing now. Uh, the survey has wrapped up and the data has been taken, but um, you know, oftentimes they have like a second life mission. Um, so they're probably still doing something with the deck cam. It's still, the camera still exists and is on the, on the telescope as far as I'm aware. Um, we're going to move down to, or move across mountains. So as uh, Shannon showed us, like uh, CTIO is on its own mountain on Cerro Tololo. That's what the C and the T is in CTIO. Um, then there's just a, you can actually see these two mountains. They're right next to each other. You can see the other observatories across the mountain on Cerro Pachon. This is where Gemini South is located. Uh, and, and also a couple of the, the next few observatories I'll talk about. Um, I won't st stick on this too long because Shannon talked about this some, but one of the really cool things that Gemini South does that makes it um, a little more unique to compare to Gemini North is that it has this um, adaptive opt optic system and it's not a new um, philosophy or a new strategy to try to um, correct for atmospheric distortion, that twinkling effect. Uh, but the, what Gemini South, Gemini South just does it so well. <laughs> it's one of the most popular um, pieces or components to the telescope. Uh, and basically, it's a giant laser beam, which, I mean, is cool to anyone who, <laughs> um, it physically looks like this huge laser beam shining up in the sky. Uh, and it's a sodium laser that basically excites atoms in the atmosphere to create a fake star. They can very, very accurately measure what that image looks like in the sky, and they know what it should be under perfect conditions, and they can pull out the atmospheric distortion data um, just by comparing that. So, um, you know, Chile is one of the best places in the world to view the skies because the atmosphere, um, the skies are pretty clear, but we still are, as Shannon mentioned, we're still underneath the atmosphere, we're not in space. So we, we still have to account for some of that for our atmosphere. It distorts images, it distorts our view of the universe. Um, so this is to show you what the, what, the, what the data looks like when you're using this giant laser beam. So not only do you get to have play with a cool, huge laser beam, but you also get really cool data. So if you had like poor conditions, this is what your data would look like. Um, this is classical adaptive optics. So like I said, adaptive op optics is not a new strategy or new technique, but GEMS just does it really well. So it can greatly improve the, uh, the data that you collect. Okay, and also on that mountain uh, is the, formerly known as the LSST project, uh, but also now it's named the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, 
I believe the survey is still LSST, but the, this is being uh, is under construction. Uh, it's actually more put together than even in this photo. Um, I believe they're planning to still do op start operations next year. And this is going to be another survey uh, telescope. So the differences are when, when you have a big telescope, everyone wants to use it, all the professional astronomers. And people think like astronomers are like the rock stars of astronomy and that they get to like look through the eyepiece and they get to go eureka and find these great, great uh, discoveries but it is like it is way more complicated than that and basically astronomers spend a lot of their time in their offices using word doc or whatever uh, to type up a proposal where they very very nicely beg the observatories to please let me use your telescope pointed at this part of the sky for this long for this reason and then the observatories get to decide that. They have some leeway as to who is using the telescope and when. Um, with surveys, it's kind of exciting because they just, the, the parameters are set. They have some kind of rough idea of what they could be doing and what they could be discovering, but it's really open. And so surveys just collect a ton of data and then as, astronomers can go use the data and do their science. They don't have to waste time like writing these big proposals when they can just, take the data and, and uh, study it. So I'm really excited for um, this survey. It's gonna be 10 years long, Let's see if I have. It's going to cover a huge swath of the sky. Um, it, let's see. What it's, the, the best description I've had uh, that was given to me about why it matters, because I can, I can throw numbers around uh, all day, but but why ultimately is is the survey important? Why do we care? Because we think of space a lot as very static. Space is huge. There's big distances between everything. Um, not a lot's changing. You know, when you look up, there, there's this, this constellations are the same that they were for your grandma, right, and everyone before her. So we we sometimes kind of think of space is static, but it's not. It's alive and it's changing even on our young, tiny time scale of a human life. And the LSST is going to show us that. It's going to take um, huge, it's going to take a bunch of pictures. It's basically going to, going to survey um, most of the southern hemisphere sky like once every three or four days, so once every several days. And then it'll just keep doing that so we can notice changes in our sky over time. It's going to study places from our solar system where we'll be able to uh, study asteroids, including near-Earth asteroids, like near-Earth objects that we should watch out for. <laughs> um, and we, it, will talk, it will be able to map out our Milky Way galaxy in more detail than we've ever done before. Um, it will also look further out into the universe. We'll be able to study things like variable stars, uh, supernova, and, and just kind of understand well, it'll sort of breathe life into our universe and our understanding of it. And there, there, it, there's a chance that there could even be a whole new classification, what we call these transient objects, these things that change in, in our sky that we don't even know yet. And that's the really exciting thing is what is this survey going to show us that we don't even know that we want to see yet. So I'm really, really excited about it. It's supposed to start next year and over the 10 year survey, it's going to collect 500 petabytes of data. That's like three months worth of Facebook data. Uh, <laughs> if that's any, um, any relation, but uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited for it. Do we have any questions at this point? Well, we got a lot of chatting going on, which is, is great about dark energy itself. So can you talk a little bit more about, we're not actually uh, observing dark energy, right? We're seeing the effects of dark energy. Can you go into a little bit more detail for the, for the group? Absolutely. Uh, so we, we, yeah, dark energy is not really such a, a, a great name for it. We don't really know what it is. We don't know that it's energy. We know that we can't see it. Um, but it, it, it's some mechanism that is sort of shaping our universe. So we can see, for example, 
um, that galaxies in our universe sort of cluster together. And this, we call it the cosmic web because that's kind of what it looks like. Um, it's so our universe is not like this evenly distributed um, distribution of galaxies. And there has to be a reason for that. Uh, and also this idea that the universe is growing or expanding it was sort of a theory for a long time, but um, there was other sort of competing theories too. Uh, but what we noticed is that not only is the universe expanding, but it's expanding faster and faster and faster and faster. So the further you look out, the, the, the faster things are expanding. It, it, it's sort of difficult to wrap your brain around, um, but the, the shape and the movement of our, gal of our universe is not that intuitive. It's not, and it's not what we originally were thinking. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we are observing are these, this very specific type of supernova called the 1A supernova. Um, I want to make sure I get this right. It's when a white dwarf star had like accretes, uh, takes uh, mass from a companion star, and then it has this bright, it's, it's just, so the reason why they're important is it's very, very bright. And, and we know how bright it's supposed to be. So it's like a, we call it a standard candle. It's a standard brightness and it's very specific and there's nothing quite like it else that you would see. So if we find one of those 1A supernovas, we can see how bright it appears to us and pretty accurately measure the distance based on how bright we know it's supposed to be versus how bright it looks. So that's why we, um, that's a big part of what the Dark Energy Survey was doing with CTIO, was to study those. So that was in one piece of it. And with a survey this large, we had a question in the chat about how much of this information is shared. You're talking about uh, all these different countries, all these different uh, ownerships of telescopes. H how does all this come together into, uh, just, you know, getting to the point where there's these amazing discoveries? That's a great question. Uh, we talked a little bit about it. Some with the surveys, sometimes this, um, the the data is is available uh, for in, for anyone. I mean, I think that there are some rules about perhaps uh, partners in um, that that partners in building the observatory and starting the survey may have time before others. I'm not entirely sure on that. I know that um, for the more traditional observatories. Um, where you proposals are, are submitted that um, percentages of countries get time. So like Chile gets, you know, maybe 10% of time for um, ALMA because it's built on their land. Um, but then, and then other countries would get different percentages based on their contributions to, to the observatory. Did, did you guys want to add anything to that, Shannon or Derek? I'm not entirely sure about surveys. Yeah, I think like it, it. I think the survey data is going to be out. I th I know we've got some folks on here from who might be able to answer who are in the audience. Um, There's some great discussion going in the yeah. chat. So you guys have you brought you brought an army of experts uh, for this show, which is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, like, but there's, um, depending on the observatory, sometimes it's going to be held by the person who requested it for a certain amount of time, and then, mm -hmm. um, then it's free and open to everybody, but. Yeah, and, and for project. observatories that have the proposals, so you, if you're an astronomer, you submit for a proposal for a project, you get accepted, um, you, your data is taken, and then it's given to you. So most astronomers don't even go to Chile, they don't actually even see the observatories, they just, the data is collected. At the observatory and given to the astronomer and then they have a period of time i think it's like a year and a half or something like that it, it might change but they have a period of time where they can do their analysis and and write and present papers but then that data is available for everyone over a certain period of time so it, you know people oftentimes can use data from other projects to learn something else completely brand new Great discussion, guys. I'm excited. So uh, I, I'm kind of following the same order that Shannon did. We started sort of by uh, outside of La Serena, um, and then we're moving north into 
the Atacama, the driest desert in the world. Uh, Alma is, um, ha has made many <laughs> monumental discoveries. Uh, I, I love this picture. This is a very early photograph of um, H.L. Tauri, Tori, sorry, H.L. Tori. Uh, and it's a protoplanetary disk. In the center here, you're seeing a very, very young star. Okay. And um, it, it was a very famous picture that was taken by Alma. And when, when I visited Alma with the, my ASAP cohort in 2018, we got to sit down with the guy who was running the whole observatory. I think he's like number two in command there. And I, I remember just being touched by that. I was like, wow, the, the hospitality at Alma um, everywhere and all the observatories, but I'm remembering Alma um, was just amazing. And we were like eight kind of Joe Schmoes, you know, like teachers, astronomer, astronomers, astrophotographers, not anyone like super noteworthy. And then, you know, the guy of operations at Alma ate lunch with us and talked with us and answered any of our questions. And one of the questions that I, I don't remember who asked in our group, but it was an excellent question. They said, what discovery has Alma made that you personally are most excited about? And he said, you know, he had to do the preface, like we've done a lot of great work and everything like that. But the thing that sticks out for me is, is this picture that you're seeing here. Um, and what I didn't realize is that this picture was one of the first photos ever taken at Alma. So when it was built, uh, you know, they wanted to take it for a test run before they opened it up for proposals. They wanted to make sure it worked. <laughs> so they had like four or five places uh, in the universe that they wanted to point the, the telescopes at and take a photo and see what it would look like. And um, this particular image was special to him because in grad school he had studied this the star uh, but it was really useful because it was you know very far away uh, i have that it is it's about 400 light years away so it's pretty far um so it would really test the resolution of of this um telescope it was it was a good distance to do that uh, and they kind of expected it to be like over exposed or underexposed or something like not super great because it was just a test run uh, and he said that he, um, he and his family were on vacation in Florida uh, and they were at a Lego store. Some of you guys might have visited that Lego, said Lego store. Where else store. would you be if you're in Florida, right? Go yeah. to Lego store. <laughs> and so he and his family were, were in a Lego store in Florida and he gets a phone call from the telescope operator and she says, I'm going to send you a picture and I want you to know that it's real data and it's not been processed. And then he gets into this photo, and based on his, his understanding, he knows that what he's seeing here is going to completely change how, how we understand planet formation, how planets form around stars, that this was completely groundbreaking. And he said that that moment was very overwhelming, like this, this moment of like, just being on the edge of science, scientific discovery and knowing that. He said it was a very overwhelming moment and then his uh, wife came up to him and said, why are you crying over Legos? <laughs> so I think that that's, um, that would certainly stick in my mind too. But what you're seeing here is in the, the middle star, in the middle of the photo, that star is only about 100,000 years old, which sounds old to us but that is an infant for a star. And the, the dust line that you're seeing, you see dark regions around, so this is a protoplanetary disk, that's what we call it, it's just like this messy sort of gas and dust and material around the, the, this baby star. The, the dark regions you're seeing suggest that something is carving out the, the lanes, so dust lanes there, something like maybe a protoplanet, something that's what could one day be a planet. This, everything we knew about how planets swim around stars said this was impossible, that this photo could not happen. So people who are experts in this field, you know, threw up their hands and said, we have to go to the drawing board. We have to 
everything we do was wrong. <laughs> and, and that sounds disheartening, but for a, a scientist, that's, that's a, a good day. Because when we can say, when we have to uh, challenge our preconceived notions, that's when we learn more. And Alma has done a really good, has, has had a few projects like this that have just really sort of fundamentally shifted our thinking of certain aspects of the universe. One, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard about this, perhaps not in this way, but in 2018, so not very long ago, um, ALMA joined a group of many other radio telescopes. So I think Shannon did a great job at explaining um, how ALMA, the 66 ALMA antennas are networked together and they can create this sort of virtual imaginary dish that can be up to like 10 miles wide. Um, well, if, and if you're interested in the science behind that, the phrase is interferometry. You can look that up. Um, it's a process that's used often. And for the Event Horizon Telescope, it's a collaboration of many radio telescopes that use this process uh, of sort of networking their observatories together to create an imaginary dish almost the size of our planet, like enormous. And so the resolution power that you could get from something like that is, you know, unlike anything we've seen. So that's what they've done. They, um, ALMA and, and these other groups of um, telescopes listed here, all across the world, they pointed their telescope at the same place and at the same time. They pointed it at M87, which is a huge elliptical galaxy in the Virgo constellation. Uh, they picked that, it, it's, <laughs> the galaxy's super far away. Um, it's 53 and a half million light years away. So we've talked about this uh, briefly uh, in this show, but um, I just want to mention that we measure distance in space by how far light can travel. So yeah, the nearest star from us is Proxima Centauri, which you can see from the southern hemisphere. It's four light years away. So even the closest star to our solar system, we we're, uh, it takes light from that st star four years to reach us. So the image that we're seeing of that star is four years old. Um, so looking deep into space is effectively looking deep back into time. So uh, it, it's kind of trippy when you think about it that way, but that's, that's, that's how it is. So um, the picture that, that we're looking at when we see M87 in the telescope, 53 million years old, okay? Uh, but it's a huge galaxy. The reason why we chose that, or they chose, I didn't have anything to do with it. They chose that spot is um, the galaxy is very far away, but it's very big and it's very bright. It has lots of old gold stars. And we know that it has a huge supermassive black hole in its center, just like many big galaxies. Nearly all of the big galaxies that we have observed have. Supermassive black holes are very common, but because this galaxy is so huge, we, you know, expected that black hole to be easy to image, and it was. They did it. I mean, it probably wasn't easy. It definitely wasn't easy. <laughs> it was a worldwide collaboration, and this little glowing donut was like the coolest thing that happened in 2018. Uh, <laughs> it, um, and and it's funny because if you talk to like black hole experts, they were like, "Meh, it's exactly what we stimulated." <laughs> But it is, and, and that's great because after decades of research about black holes, we, know, we can characterize them in three ways only. We can tell you their location, what direction they spin, and how big they are. And that's it, that's all we can tell you. Um, so being able to take a photograph, of course you can't actually see the black hole because black holes take, suck in everything including light. Um, but what you are seeing here is um, a big disk of like glowing gas. So the black hole is gonna be much, much smaller uh, in the center-ish of this shadow here. That's the best way I've heard described it is that black in the middle is the shadow of the black hole, but not really like the black hole is much smaller than that. Um, even the event horizon, which is the point of no return, like if you reach that point in front of a black hole, no one will ever see you again. Even if you're a photon, a particle of light, you're, you're a goner, okay? So even that is, is a little bit smaller than this. Um, you can see that the, 
the top is dimmer than the bottom, that's showing motion. So the gas is being hurtled towards us, towards the bottom here. And that makes it appear a little brighter, which is something that they modeled uh, and expected. To get a, a size comparison, uh, this is our sun. The black hole in, that is in the middle here is like 65 billion times the mass of our sun, it's just mind bogglingly uh, massive. The, the orbit that you're seeing here is the orbit of Pluto. And then this dot here, barely exiting the, the shadow of that black hole, is the furthest that humankind has ever traveled, ever. <laughs> so it's, I, I love this story because it took the whole world to take this image. You know, science does not happen with one person, it, you know, it, it happens in teams. It, it, you, have, you have to have huge amounts of people collaborating and working together across cultures, across countries, uh, all different opinions, you know, and you're all working together to make something ha like this happen. This, came, this photo came out yesterday from Alma. It is, uh, it is a spiraling elliptical galaxy that is in the very, very early uh, universe. So it's only, it's only like one and a half billion years roughly after the Big Bang, which um, in terms of how, uh, what we know about galaxy formation, again, shouldn't have happened. That we, uh, all of our models of galaxy formation right now, which is a new area in astronomy, um, but all of our models so far say that that can't happen until like six billion years into after the Big Bang. So the fact that they imaged this galaxy, first of all, it's like the furthest elliptical galaxy that they've ever imaged, um, but also it shows that our idea of how galaxies form needs to be rethought, which is another exciting day in astronomy. So I wanted to end with, um, uh, mention, Shannon mentioned our project, Big Astronomy. This is, um, this is an attempt basically for a group of us to share the story of um, how it takes all, the, all these um, huge groups of amazing people uh, in these unique, incredible places uh, working together in order to make these discoveries possible. And so that's the story that Big Astronomy is telling that it's going to be through a planetarium show uh, I think we have a link to the trailer if you're interested. Um, of course, when planetariums reopen, that'll be available at a planetarium near you. But <laughs> uh, until then, we have a website which has tons of information. We have our social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, and we are engaging with um, observatory staff members, interviewing them, uh, just engaging more deeply in this story. That, that Chili can share with us. So uh, does anyone have anything that you guys want to add or any questions or anything? Yeah, a couple. Um, and this one could probably be either for you or, or Shannon. Um, can you talk a little bit about how radio astronomy has been impacted by Starlink? <laughs> and that? <laughs> I don't know if I can in answer a, in, that In a question. very short window. <laughs> But the, yeah, just uh, what what is the uh, radio astronomy impact to the you know these satellites that are are now orbiting the Earth? I I don't know the specifics. Remember, we we actually got to go down to the VLA, the very large array in uh, New Mexico back in October, and this was asked there, and it was uh, basically Starlink is very bad for radio astronomy, and the hope is to be able to work uh, with with Starlink and the folks in order to actually um, mitigate some of the negative effects. But um, yeah, you, you're basically putting up a bunch of blinders on the telescope. Is that is that a correct way to say that, Tiffany? <laughs> yeah, it creates a lot of uh, noise and distortion. And um, I don't know, I, I kind of feel like we, we need more space lawyers. <laughs> Feels weird to say that, but we need space law. We need, we need someone sort of 
uh, governing this because people are putting up a lot of satellites in orbit and and sometimes they can really, really deeply negatively impact um, science. And this is science that's being done from with taxpayer dollars. So it's it's important. It's important work and it's something that taxpayers should be invested in. Yeah, if I may add as well, so we were talking about the LSST earlier, these big wide surveys as well. A lot of people when they deal, talk about Starlink, they uh, you know, it's, radio astronomy is definitely something that's mis, uh, mislooked because, you know, everybody's worried about seeing the satellites in the sky, yeah. but it, it really isn't impacting. But the other thing is, is that, you know, there's been talks about, and there's actually several, uh, I think one or two satellites up there right now that have a lower uh, reflection rate, because uh, these are fairly large satellites. And um, the thing is, though, when you're doing big surveys, like looking for near-Earth asteroids and things like that, you know, these satellites can impact any of those observations. Um, so, um, you know, those are things that, you know, it, it, it greatly affects not only, you know, you know uh, high resolution views, but also very wide field views as well. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, one of the answers that we got, because uh, I, was, I was the crazy person that asked that question at uh, the BLA when we went uh, together, uh, the director, she mentioned, um, that at least for the VLA in New Mexico, um, that um, there is going to be the possibility of that SpaceX will communicate or Starlink will communicate, SpaceX with Starlink will communicate um, with uh, the observatories and they'll basically cut off their frequencies at, as they pass by. Um, because when you go to a radio observatory today, you have to turn off your phone, you have to turn off devices that produce radio frequencies so they don't interference. So uh, we like to hope that all the countries and all the different organizations work together. But uh, as Tiffany mentioned earlier, it takes a huge team. It takes a, an international collaboration. And hopefully, uh, if everybody keeps talking about this, make a lot of noise, uh, hopefully we'll be able to douse the noise uh, with space uh, with Starlink. So, um, so that yeah, it's it's definitely a beginning of a of a new era of stuff getting up there in space. <laughs> I, I wanted to mention that Connie did say in the comments that um, that SpaceX, who who is in charge of Starlink, is working very closely with the the radio astronomers and the radio observatories, but um, the the Rubin Observatory. Uh, is going to be deeply Im impacted by this and it's, you know, the conversations are just right. starting. So that's good. It, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's good that the, I mean, cause the, the spirit of what people want to do is, is probably similar. So it, it's good that they're having those conversations, but it, it is certainly a challenge. Yeah, the continuing that open dialogue between yeah these companies is huge. Um, when when we talk about the future, you've got um, James Webb Space Telescope about to hopefully launch here soon. You've got uh, Nancy Grace Roman uh, working, but you're also building all of these uh, beautiful telescopes on the ground. Where do you see the future going? Are we uh, going to continue to just build bigger, uh, you know, utilize a network of telescopes on the Earth, or do you see us putting more uh, telescopes up into space? I think we're going to do both. Uh, what, one of the neat things about how uh, there's there's going to be a huge jump in terms of technology for ground-based telescopes. They're reaching critical mass in terms of how big a mirror can be made. Um, if you get a, a, a glass, a piece of, there's only so, there's only so big a piece of glass can be before it'll just crush under its own weight. So uh, what they're doing are segmented mirrors where it's just a series of tiny mirrors that are sort of stitched together to create this giant, gigantic primary mirror. Um, and that's exciting. So we can, there's a, a workaround to make even bigger uh, telescopes here on Earth. But we're also doing space telescopes. We have the JWST that's gonna be launched soon. And to add to that, I mean, there's a requirement for space telescopes. Not all wavelengths of light can make it through our atmosphere. So we are going to have to do both. And um, when it comes to also, if you want to just think about telescopes in terms of sustainability um, and just thinking about what's going on in space, um, as Tiffany was saying, we're putting all this stuff up there. 
these satellites die, but then they stay in orbit around us. They eventually decay in their orbit and they fall back down to Earth. And then we have this junk that's fallen down. We have this junk that's floating around that we now have to look past that can disturb what we're looking at. And so if we want to think more sustainably to the future, ground-based is going to be the way to go because we have Hubble, which just celebrated its 30th anniversary, which is amazing for a space telescope, but it's not going to last much longer. Whereas you have the Blanco telescope, we've been able to extend its life through new instruments over time, and now it's hitting about 50 years. So I think um, that's, a, that's sort of what you have to, to look back and forth between is, what do we have to put in space versus what can we continue to innovate with on Earth where we can continue to extend the life for much longer? And I would like to add too, um, that's really, and I, I loved about the big astronomy program is the sustainability of, of work and a lot of, of, of employment. Um, you know, one of the things we noticed when we went to these observatories is as, to, as both Shannon and Tiffany mentioned earlier, there are no astronomers really there. I mean, they're getting basically quote unquote Dropbox folders of data sent to them. Um, these people that are working in the observatories, these are people that live locally. They're, 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 it's providing a, a economy that's built into these areas. It provides jobs and resources for communities. And it, it, it also helps kind of celebrate that area. It, it, it increases this awareness of astronomy in these areas. So ground-based telescopes not only help with uh, astronomy, but they help with the economies of those areas and, and improve the quality of life for people in these areas as well. So, Absolutely. I, I saw earlier uh, in the comments some discussion about astrotourism, and, and that is very um, a very important component of the economy in some of the larger cities near these observatories in Chile. Uh, so, and, and I highly recommend signing up if you're really interested in astronomy, uh, go as a tourist to Chile because they have um, they have some amazing infrastructure already there. They have uh, bed and breakfasts where they they pull out telescopes at night, um, and and they have expert astronomers showing you details of the nighttime sky. You know, there's tours of these observatories, so that that is a huge the the economic component can't be understated for sure. All right, a couple more questions. Um, one is how did Otto and Lori get their names? I think they told us that. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't either. But they're the best. I uh, I climbed on the wheels of the of Otto. I think it was, and um, it was difficult, and I got some weird looks. But <laughs> it was it was worth it. Good like, times. It's like uh, playing on one of the crawlers, right? It can't can yeah. be. <laughs> I don't know can why you... that was my instinct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the uh, uh, anyone that's interested in the educator ambassador program? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's this show is a testament of how great it is. Like all three of us have gone to Chile, but we were all, all in different years, but we still work together and, and uh, even years after we've gone. So it, it's it's the definitely a program that continues on giving like the, the trip to Chile is amazing. Um, but you can go to the website, uh, astroambassadors.com. Um, I think they just closed applications for this year, but we're, we're intending to keep this, this program going. So please apply. Uh, they do it every year. Cohort goes usually in July, which is winter in Chile. And one of our local uh, 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 cohorts got uh, accepted, right, Derek? Yes, so I was actually going to make a shout out to one of our uh, Florida planetarians, Jason Schreiner. Uh, he uh, oh, just got accepted. He's with the Museum of Art and Science in Daytona. He's a good friend of ours and fellow uh, planetarian nearby. So yay, Jason. Awesome. So, Congratulations, uh, Jason. So I'm, I'm super excited for him to be part of that. Um, and I and I can't, I can't uh, you know, uh, yeah, speak, I mean, just, it's, it's an incredible experience. You're going to meet uh, fantastic people. I still uh, talk to many of my friends that are part of, or he's, uh, part of the team and got a chance to meet all new different people in different parts of the country. And um, it's just a, a fantastic experience, uh, not only for the astronomy, but for the culture, for the history, for the geology. I'm a big geology nerd. Seeing the Andes 
and being on top of these mountains and just and just you know uh, it's just a truly amazing experience. Um, so if you are somebody that you know wants to uh, you know, provide you know an educational resource for Chile and be an ambassador, I highly recommend it. And uh, as Tiffany mentioned earlier, we're gonna you know I, I imagine there's gonna be support for this for as much as as we can. So um, so definitely the links for that are in the comments section, right, Justin? All yes, right. sir. They are. Excellent. So, all right. We have, we have a lot of ambassadors in the comments that have been talking and, and yeah, having yeah. There's a lot, of, discussion. a lot of love in there. Right? This has definitely been the most active chat uh, for all the shows we've done so far. So this is a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, any other? How ASAP is how, how great ASAP is. Like we're all there for each other, always supporting each other. Even the big astronomy project has is I think a majority ASAP ambassadors at this point. So, um, yeah. Well, Shannon, a bunch of people love your glasses. They wanted me to tell you. <laughs> and um, yeah, last question, yes. Okay, so M87, beautiful image. Should we expect to see Sagittarius A anytime soon? So they did, so Sagittarius A star is the black hole in the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And of course we had to take a picture of home, right? So I, they did collect data. Um, it's my understanding that it's not such a great photo. So I don't know if it's going to be released. What do you guys, do you guys know anything else? Yeah, there's, you know? still, yeah, there's still processing the data, but uh, yeah, it, from what I gather too, is it's not as exciting as eight, 87. And 87 is a massive, massive, super giant elliptical. So that black hole is <laughs> it's pretty Huge. crazy. So it's kind of hard to compare um, both our and the, galaxy. And the orientation is good too, yeah. like that, that matters, you know, yeah, it's, exactly. it's in some ways harder to, to, observe, to un, uh, observe and understand our own galaxy than any other galaxy out there because being inside of it is difficult. All those dust lanes and all that stuff um, gets in the way. And of course, you know, Alma uses radio, so that's not much of an issue, but um, you know, again, we have a lot of interference uh, in our galaxy. So yeah, it's, 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 it's really crazy to think that by studying other galaxies, we have a better appreciation for our own galaxy uh, and, and what we, what we, where we are and what we are. So it's pretty cool. Well, I want to um, thank both Shannon and Tiffany for joining us. Uh, thank you both for being here and sharing your passion with, uh, with the observatories and the science. It's incredible. I mean, there are a few things that I, when you were talking, I was like, wow, this is really, really cool stuff. And, uh, and uh, again, you know, Chile is, again, the capital of astronomy. And there's just, it's just, the, you know, the breaking point for some of the amazing things that are going to continue to happen there. And uh, like uh, Tiffany said, definitely go to, if you get a chance, once this uh, pandemic is over and you're able to travel again, please uh, take an opportunity to go to Chile. I know Justin and I, we're uh, possibly working with a professor, uh, Professor uh, Nesser. Uh, with Seminole State, we're actually thinking about bringing a group uh, to Chile for a study abroad. So we're keeping our fingers crossed um, and, uh, and hopefully get to inspire some uh, new scientists and engineers. Um, so anyways, I want to, before we end, I want to talk about some of our other things. I want to let you know that next Thursday, uh, we actually are not doing a show next Thursday. Yeah, we are going to be taking a quick break, uh, but we are on June 4th are going to be doing, we're working with the theater company. Uh, at, the, at Seminole State, and we're doing a live reading of Silent Sky, um, and that is going to be a Zoom-only event, so I believe right now they're, we're currently working on logistics on uh, RSVPs for that, um, but uh, stick around. We'll hopefully be able to post that information later on as we finally get the, get the information for that, uh, but we are, co but uh, Justin, you want to talk a little about tomorrow night, what we're doing, what, what's going on tomorrow night? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're free tomorrow night, um, gosh, we have a treat for you. Uh, we are partnering up with the Smithsonian for a national star party. And we've got uh, uh, different astronomy groups in um, every time zone in the United States. We will be, I think we're up first, Eric, right at 10 p.m. Eastern. Because we're the so most ten East. <laughs> <laughs> right. 10 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be looking at, uh, uh, gosh, we've got, well, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but we're yeah, going to be looking at some amazing come out objects. It, right? Yes, come out and check it out. We're going to be uh, doing live stacking telescope views of the night sky. 
And you can watch our uh, portion of the show and then stay and watch uh, some of our uh, other um, uh, fellow astronomers across uh, the United States uh, do the same thing. And we're just going to have a lot of fun, a free live webcast. And uh, uh, they did an initial one, I think, last month that went pretty well. And they're expecting this one to be even bigger. So I am really excited about tomorrow night. So, Justin, now uh, with our virtual star parties, we usually do them on Facebook Live, but this one's a little different. It's actually being done on YouTube. So, we'll, uh, so there is a YouTube uh, link that uh, Justin will post on the Facebook comments. Uh, all you have to do is visit that YouTube link at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern time, and uh, basically we'll get started. Uh, now, Shannon and Tiffany, is there anything that you want to mention? Any upcoming events from your side of the world? Uh, any any upcoming cool things that you want to share with our audience that may be watching and might want to check out? Um, folks can follow us on Facebook at Abrams Planetarium. Uh, we've been doing a lot of virtual programming. We do a celestial story time a couple times a week. And uh, usually on Mondays at 10, we do an experiment along at home. We won't be doing one this Monday because of the holiday, but our next one is June 1st, and it's all about volcanoes in space. So we're gonna be doing some fun volcano experiments. So if people wanna come check those out on our page, um, everyone's welcome. Fantastic. Yeah, but uh, we, we're also doing virtual programming at uh, Ward Beecher Planetarium is at WB Planetarium uh, on Facebook. We, our public shows, our online public shows are Saturdays at 8. And this Saturday we'll be talking about a star's life cycle. So if you're interested, pop on in. I'd love to see some uh, folks from Florida. I grew up in the South, so I'd love to see some Southern folks in our, right. in our comments. And as you can see, every you know we're doing our we're we're doing so many cool things uh, virtually while uh, our facilities are closed. So definitely support um, you know the Abrams Planetarium and the Ward Beecher Planetarium uh, and their amazing programs as well. So uh, that pretty much wraps up tonight. So I want to again thank you, Shannon and Tiffany, for joining us uh, tonight for our program. And um, and for those that are watching, thank you for. Uh, for your time and uh, enjoying this program. Hope it was very informative to you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again on a future virtual public show. And with that, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Take care.